and welcome to another episode of the Leo Alves podcast. And in today's episode, I have a guest with me who's been on before. His name is Miguel. And actually, this is the first podcast episode I'm ever doing face to face with another person. It's always been over Zoom. Uh, so this is going to be something different for me as well. Uh, but otherwise, again, he's been on the podcast before. So I'll let him introduce himself. Like uh, maybe we could do like a 60 second summary and then we'll go from there. So over to you, Miguel. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. It's uh, an honor to be here face to face. I know for you listening, nothing changes, but for us, it's quite interesting. So my 60 second elevator pitch, uh, my name is Miguel Minch. Uh, I work as a PT and nutrition coach, much like Leo. I have a background in cookery. And if I had to describe myself, I would say I'm a food and muscle nerd. I like living a healthy lifestyle and everything that's about food, nutrition, or just how to feel good, look good, and live, you know. Pretty damn awesome lifestyle, that's what I care about. So um, without further ado, let's get back to the podcast. You've got 10 seconds left. I've got 10 I'm seconds. playing, I'm playing. Okay, so I actually, you know, you, you did ask me before the podcast if I had anything in mind uh, to speak about and... Uh, yeah, I said I did, and something sprang to mind quite spontaneously, like 10 minutes before the podcast, that I thought would be quite good to speak about, because I've never really spoken about this before, and I don't know how much you'll have to say about it, but what's your opinion on just caffeine, and maybe <laughs> just coffee in general, caffeine, because I feel like, uh, you know, there's a lot that could potentially be said about it, and uh, I was just curious about where your mind goes with it. Okay, so I'm, I'm just... I find this very curious because we didn't talk about this before recording, but I am in the middle of uh, a no caffeine experiment. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> so I usually drink maybe one to two cups of coffee every day. Uh, but right now I haven't had a single coffee in the past maybe almost 30 days. Oh, wow. Yeah. How's that going? It's going pretty well, actually. I'm so happy I picked this as a subject because now I, I I feel like I've got so much to ask you already about it. <laughs> yeah. So what made you... You know what? Continue before I even ask other questions. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Uh, and it, it's been an interesting experiment. Um, maybe I should just give a bit of background information on why I decided to do this. So from a nutrition background, caffeine is definitely, um, you know, a very effective and studied uh, supplement, if you can call it that. I'm not just talking about coffee, actually caffeine, although most people consume caffeine with their coffee. Um, so for me, I've always liked having a cup of coffee in the morning and one after lunch. It's like a good pick-me-up, not necessarily something I needed, but something I enjoyed. Um, but then um, recently I was in Mexico uh, with a friend and he's always uh, also in the health and fitness space and we were talking about stimulants and how uh, caffeine is probably the most consumed drug in the world and because it's so um, accessible people don't even stop to think about the long-term effects of just having you know multiple coffees per day or what it could be doing not just from um, a performance uh, standpoint like using caffeine to boost your workouts or have a bit of energy but if it could be also uh, tinkering with your uh, mood or your habitual energy levels for example uh, one of the things we talked about was if you get um, accustomed to taking coffee every day and then you stop then you'll feel like shit uh, but if you never take caffeine and then you use caffeine uh, sporadically as a way of increasing your uh, cognition or your performance then you can get uh, more out of it than if you're always taking it so it was that was one of the points that um, kind of made me reevaluate or just question my habits I, I do intend to go back to drinking coffee after um, I think when I feel I'm ready uh, but yeah there was a lot that went into that that, that discussion uh, and it made me realize okay maybe I'll uh, give it a try and stop drinking coffee for a bit to see how I feel. Um, and yeah, here I am. <laughs> wow. So, and you said today is day 30? Mm, no, but I'm getting close to it. Today is April 1st. So I think I stopped drinking coffee like on the 6th or 5th of March. So that's like 20 something days. And how was the first few days? 
Um, so I've quit coffee before, like cold turkey. And I remember those first days or first week, it was really awful. Like no energy and um, headaches, the usual stuff. But this time, um, so I quit while I was traveling back to Portugal. So I was in a 16 hour flight, I think. So I didn't have any coffee because I wanted to sleep. And then when I got back home, I didn't have any coffee at home. So I didn't have any coffee for two days just because I was out of coffee. And then when I noticed three days had gone by, I was still feeling pretty good. And I was like, you know what? This is a sign from the gods. I'm not going to have any coffee for how long this experiment will last. Um, so I haven't had any side effects, really. Maybe on the first week, I think I slept a lot more than usual. So... Uh, usually I'd say I sleep anywhere between seven to nine hours on those first, maybe three to four days. I slept like 10 to 13, but again, is it the caffeine or what is it? Because I was also tired from a long trip and my, um, jet lag. It's exactly. Rhythm. Exactly. Yeah. So I was jet lagged. It's, it's a five hour difference from Mexico and Portugal, which isn't huge. Uh, That's less than I thought. Yeah. Yeah. When I came back from Bali, it's an eight hour difference. And, and that one, that was tough. Uh, but yeah, jet lag, tired, no caffeine, all of those factors can definitely, you know, change a lot of things. But yeah, I slept like a baby for the first week, 12 to 13 hours. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, you've, now you mentioned jet lag, it wants me to, I, I want to speak about that as well. But I've, uh, before we go even into anything else, I still want to speak about coffee more. And uh, my history of, so first of all, that is very interesting, everything you've said. And I want to like give you a bit of background on my history with coffee. Uh, so then we have, you know, more context uh, for the conversation that we're having. But I don't think I ever had a cup of coffee. And this is going to surprise a lot of people. I think the first time I ever had a cup of coffee was when I was actually 22. Okay. Yeah, it's crazy, right? Yeah. I just, I don't know. I held off on it a long time. I was just never interested in having it. Mm. And uh, yeah, I didn't care for it. And then uh, I remember the first few times I had coffee, like from the off, I would say I was quite good with it because I would never have more than one a day. Mm. So because I, I, I was aware that it could be like quite a good tool, almost you could say, to have like the caffeine is like a, a really good boost or pick, pick me up or like just like a almost like a like great for a pre-workout, for example. And um, and I kind of would use it for that. And I didn't want to get too desensitized to it. So I'd never have more than one a day. And until this day, I, I stick to that rule for myself. I never have more than one a day. Very rarely have I had two in the same day. I think I could count on on maybe two hands when I've had two on the same day. And uh, I'll never forget the first few times I had coffee after going through an entire life of never having coffee. I remember it was just like a regular coffee. Nothing special. Not, not strong. I remember it would like have me on high alert like I felt like very stimulated or I don't uh, or I can't even think of a, a better word for it right now but it definitely was a huge pickup and I could feel I was very sensitive to it and the the more time has gone like instantly I quite liked coffee quite a lot and it started becoming a part of my routine before I knew it and I would have one like every morning and uh, that's how I, I have it just every morning and then that's it and um and nowadays when I think about it, I'm definitely not as like sensitive to it as when i first started naturally and um but yeah like it is something i've just thought about like should i stop drinking it and then i thought even though i'm like less sensitive to it nowadays i feel like i'm quite good at it because and the reason why i, I say i'm quite good i feel like i'm quite good with it or maybe it's just like I'm, i feel like i'm maybe more mindful of it compared to a lot of people because you know in the portuguese culture as you know you know you're, you're born and raised in portugal uh, I'm born and raised in London, England, but my parents are Portuguese. I've come to Portugal every summer and I live here nowadays. So, you know, we're two people who are very aware of Portuguese culture. And maybe this is not just Portuguese culture, but like Southern European culture as a whole, where it's just they love their espresso. And I see people here, you know, family members included, friends included, who maybe don't give a damn about health and fitness so much. It's wake up, espresso. Breakfast, espresso. Lunch, espresso. Dinner, espresso. Like afternoon snack, espresso. Before bed, espresso. I, I, I you, I'm not exaggerating. Yeah, I'm yeah. not exaggerating. I see this a lot. And yeah, we, can you relate on that part where you, that's what you do you see in some people? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's like I, I don't even know how it gets. Like it's just, I guess, a cultural thing. Yeah. 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 
these people, but by that point, you're definitely desensitized to it, right? Or what? Like, I'm sure there's like some effects that maybe someone who knows a lot more about caffeine could speak to me about, because I'd be lying if I said I was an expert on caffeine. Mm -hmm. But um, you you look like you were going to say something. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely not an expert on caffeine, uh, but um, I don't like saying I did my research, but... When I did my master's degree in sports nutrition, caffeine was uh, a hot topic as well. And we did discuss more than just the performance benefits. Uh, and over the years, just basically, again, I, I love going deep into rabbit holes about different things. So caffeine has definitely been one of those topics that I wanted to know more about. Not just, um, again, not just the performance and health benefits, but what it can actually do. In terms of the brain again i'm not a neuroscientist so i'm not an expert on this area but and this is where it's interesting uh when i was in mexico uh with that friend of mine we had um dinner with one of his good friends and he is a neuroscientist and he was actually the one that made me question my uh, habitual caffeine intake uh, so the way he was uh describing the effects of long-term caffeine consumption on the brain and how it can um, kind of affect your just uh, natural energy levels. That's what kind of made me uh, question myself as in, okay, why am I taking caffeine? What am I getting out of it? Uh, is it a crutch or is it something that I truly enjoy? And I think this is very uh, beneficial, not just for caffeine, but any habit that you might have, be it related to health and fitness or anything else. Just sometimes we've been doing the same things we've been doing for months, years, and we don't question them. We just assume that it is what it is. So sometimes I, I find that it's important to stop and question yourself. Okay, uh, where am I? What are my current goals? And how are, are my habits serving me if they're serving me? Uh, so caffeine was one of those. And um, one of the examples I can give you, completely unrelated to performance, but uh, just general well-being, was sometimes I felt like uh, just working, I would get uh, anxious, or uh, even just at, at home by myself, just working on something, I would feel stressed, or um, just my heart uh, would start racing a bit, and I, I thought maybe caffeine, or maybe reducing my caffeine intake could somehow improve that. Um, and I want to say it did help a bit, but at the same time, I noticed that what helped even more than the caffeine was learning how to cope with stress and work. So again, I, I always say, uh, to, uh, my clients and just anyone looking at nutrition or health and fitness, there are so many different variables that it's always difficult to pinpoint the exact reason why something has changed. Like you can stop drinking caffeine and suddenly uh, you feel better, but you might have changed something in your routine or your uh, diet as well that's contributing to that and you don't even know. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, but again, I, I think maybe it's easier if I go back to you in terms of questions you might have about uh, or caffeine or coffee because I'm already going on a, a complete tangent here. Uh, but there, there's a lot that this experiment has been teaching me. Um, so, yeah, maybe let's start with that. Do you have any questions that are going on in your mind right now? Because I can see you <laughs> looking at me. No, it's a, it, to be honest, like you, you said you do plan to reintroduce it. Do yeah. you think you'll be going back to having one in the morning and one at lunch? Or do you think if you reintroduce it, it will be something maybe just one a day? Or like, do you think you would approach it differently to how you were before? Mm. So usually, um, and this is interesting because you did, like when you said the Portuguese love their coffee and their espresso, that's that's true. There's a lot of people here, they like having an espresso after dinner, and we have dinner very late in the evening. So sometimes, I don't know, it's, it's, it's very common for people to finish their meal at 9 or 10 p.m. and then chug an espresso and just carry on with their evening yeah and it has no effect and i'm just like what the hell like if that was me who's if i'm having an espresso before sleep i'm not sleeping that night i mean it has no effect at least that's what most people say and then, yeah, yeah 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 that's what they say i think it could be a, and i know sorry for interrupting but like uh i think maybe they're 
so normalized like the feeling of caffeine or an espresso impacting their sleep is so normalized to them that they don't realize that it's impacting them anymore yeah exactly again going back to the habits if you've been doing something for god knows how long you might not even um think it's related to poor sleep quality for example if you usually have an espresso every night and you know most nights you can actually sleep but then some nights you have a bit of insomnia like you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't go back to sleep maybe you don't even think it's the espresso it's something else maybe you're stressed maybe it's that deadline that's coming up uh but there are two i think major points here one of them is people uh different people metabolize uh, caffeine differently so some people uh can metabolize am i saying that right i think so metabolize metabolize yeah um process caffeine uh faster than others and um those people they might be able to have an espresso after dinner and they can pretty much sleep with no issues at all and then people that uh take longer to process caffeine they might have an espresso at 5 3 p.m. and they might feel like their sleep quality is impaired for me usually i have a, a cutoff point about maybe 2 3 p.m. so um i'll have one coffee in the morning just because i like that uh and then i'll have uh, another coffee after lunch uh also because i i like that uh the um, the way it kind of complements the meal but i guess that's a very cultural thing because now I'm not necessarily having coffee, but uh, I still maintain uh, the, the habit with, with decaf. Uh, and I know some people, they hate decaf. They think it's uh, even worse than coffee and it has no benefits. And I think there's a lot to discuss there, especially because... Do you like decaf? I love decaf, yeah. If, if it's good quality decaf, I love it. Um, again, because I, I like the, the taste of coffee. You know, if you remove caffeine... From the coffee, sure, it's not the same thing, but it's still quite good, uh, in my opinion. Um, but, again, and this is interesting in the research as well. So, coffee seems to have some uh, protective um, health uh, effects. For example, in terms, I think, uh, habitual coffee consumption uh, has been associated with lower risk of cardiovascular disease or some protective effects in some uh, types of cancer. Um, if I'm not mistaken, colorectal, colorectal cancer is one of them. Uh, but the same thing is not, uh, has not been observed in decaf, uh, which is kind of interesting, because if you just remove the caffeine from it, somehow it changes the effects it has. Uh, and for me, it was really sad to hear about that, because I was like, maybe I can still get the benefits if, if I... If I'm drinking decaf, but it doesn't seem to be that way. I, it doesn't seem to happen that way. Um, anyways, I drink it mostly because I enjoy it. Uh, but I do plan to reintroduce caffeine at some point. Mainly because, again, probably a cultural thing and just I do like my coffee. In the yeah, morning. I love my coffee. That's why I was thinking. I've been I've been asking myself. I ask myself time to time, oh, should I, you know, have a break from coffee? And I'm just like, mm, I don't feel like I need one. Like, I could maybe do with one, but I feel like I have a, a fairly good relationship with it. What I do try and do, though, is maybe like, and I could probably do just more, but could, because, you're like, like you said, maybe there is some value in stopping a habit when you kind of like just have been doing it routine for so long. Um, but like maybe every two weeks, I won't have coffee for one day, which I know is nothing. But even then, that day is just like, ugh, it's not the same. Because, uh, like, I guess I've also associated coffee with just, like, starting my day now. And uh, and, and that's just uh, something interesting as well to, that I've uh, thought about. But, yeah, I thought it would be quite um, interesting, uh, quite an interesting uh, topic to speak about. What about using a uh, coffee for, like, a, a pre-workout? Because I do quite like doing that as well. Yeah. I... Or espresso. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a fantastic idea. Yeah. Uh, and if you don't usually drink coffee, then, you know, if, if you do have a coffee before your workout, it's definitely going to pack a punch and you're going to feel it. Um, and then for those of us that uh, 
drink coffee pretty much every day if you do have you know a, a tough workout coming up and you do need that extra boost like extra extra boost you can always ramp up the the dosage and just have more coffee <laughs> i know that for a lot of people that this depends if you usually have one coffee per day having two or even three on one given day it's probably not going to be the end of the world mm. but if you're like most portuguese and uh you're drinking I, i'm gonna say anywhere between three to five espressos per day some people that's more. insane to me still yeah <laughs> yeah I'm, i wouldn't recommend going you know beyond five six. surely like beyond even maybe two or three that there's probably like a, a or even i think even one I, i don't know again i'm no expert on caffeine or, or coffee it, isn't there shown to be like a, ne a negative effect on blood pressure i mean it could be uh but then again the individual context depends yeah 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 uh but That's that's a good point. That's a very good point, and so, I'm I'm not sure if I have the the answer. So I imagine with five, yeah, because yeah. I I know it can negatively impact blood pressure for sure. I think yeah. again, I'm sure it's individualistic, uh, maybe again, uh, but yeah, I I think if you're drinking five a day, consistently for a long time, I I would probably check my blood pressure. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And I, just to, to just to, not to scare anyone, but just to be on the safe side. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And again, most people drink coffee without even considering what's uh yeah, the effect it's having on their bodies, yeah. you know. They just it's it's a a cultural thing, it's yeah. something they do, they don't even think about it. Mm. If if you've been dealing with uh, you know, high levels of anxiety or uh poor sleep quality, um you know, it might be related to how much coffee you're drinking. So sometimes I think For those people, it's an interesting experiment to, hey, again, I wouldn't recommend quitting caffeine or coffee cold turkey, which a lot of people do. They're like, okay, I'm stopping. And they go from five espressos to no espresso. And and that's the end of the world. At least that first week, everything comes crashing down. It's it's a massive headache. Um, and it's, it's not fun. It's just uh, not fun at all. Uh, but just try and reduce the the amount of caffeine you're ingesting. So maybe go from five to four espressos on week one and then from four to three until eventually you go to one. And if you're feeling ready, try uh, going from one to zero. Um, this is actually a bit of uh, a tangent, but I do remember, and this might be interesting, uh, one of the downsides, and this was probably the, the worst downside of uh, when I stopped having ca uh, coffee, was so recently yeah, yeah yeah recently recently um so I'm, i'm sure you know and most people know when you have that morning coffee usually helps to um get uh the let's just call it the digestive system working properly and it, it's caffeine increases gastric motility in other words it, it helps you Uh, go to the bathroom in that the morning. That explains a lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So usually when you have uh, a coffee in the morning, you might feel like, whoop, time to go. Nature, yeah. Nature's oh, calling. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, for me, coffee always had that effect. Uh, no doubt. Same. Yeah, as soon as I stopped drinking coffee in the morning, the first week or maybe week and a half was really weird uh, in the sense that I stopped feeling the that... Uh, needs to go to the bathroom every morning and i actually had a bit of constipation for really yeah yeah like i would say two to three days interesting yeah despite eating a lot of fiber as usual so mm. um again just to give a bit of a reference value i'd say for most people usually i recommend a minimum of like 25 grams of fiber uh depending uh if you're uh, a man or a woman but usually around that 25 grams of ballpark numbers is a good uh place to be and i was eating roughly the usual 35 to 40 grams of fiber per day so fiber wasn't necessarily an issue but i was still um dealing with constipation even despite mm. being you know physically active like training drinking plenty of water eating um lots of fruits and vegetables um and the only thing at least in my opinion that changed was the the, the coffee But you said just for the first three days, right? And then I'm assuming you went back to normal? Yeah. Yeah, I would say it's it's getting better. It's definitely better. I feel like it's normalized now. But again, going when I was having coffee, it was almost 
instant. I would have the coffee and maybe in five, 10 minutes, I'd go to the bathroom, easy. Uh, now it's most days that kind of happens, but it's not, um, it's not the same feeling. And some days I'm just like, okay, uh, this feels odd because it's been, again, I've been drinking coffee for years now. So it's always been part of that morning routine, like get breakfast, get a coffee, go to the bathroom, start your day. And I know this might seem a bit, uh, TMI. Yeah. TMI. To no, discuss but it's, on a podcast. It's, no, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But just, these There's are value the, in it. Exactly. These are the tiny details that people care about, but they don't hear. Uh, and they're important. Yeah. 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 For sure. Like if you're dealing with constipation, I'll be the first to say that it, it can mess up your day. Like you're not feeling great and then you're like, eh. you go by your day uh, thinking about it. Uh, so yeah, that was one of the things that initially I felt like uh, was making me reconsider uh, just hopping back uh, on my morning coffee. Um, and it's also probably one of the main reasons that eventually I want to get back to having that morning coffee. Not necessarily because I think I need it to start the day. Same. Yeah, I actually feel... Um, this is a bit of a tough, uh, it, it, it's a tough uh, matter because I like having that coffee in the morning because of the way uh, it makes me feel. But at the same time, I don't like having that cup of coffee in the morning if I'm just going to do, um, if I'm just going to sit in front of the computer and work because I don't need that, you know, jolt of energy uh, first thing in the morning if I'm not going to train or if I'm not going to do anything. Uh, physically demanding although you can you can say that coffee also helps you be a bit more sharp like mentally sharp um so it depends and just to kind of uh give a bit more nuance to this whole topic of the different effects caffeine can have uh, so i didn't have any issues with energy or appetite it was mostly um constipation but I've had uh, clients of mine that we've done some, uh, you know, resensitive, re yeah, just phases with no caffeine to resensitize uh, their tolerance to caffeine, and some of them reported that they their appetite skyrocketed. They were very hungry when they weren't having any caffeine. Uh, some of them, you know, again uh, reported sleeping better and uh, less anxiety throughout the day. And some, after that initial period of one to two weeks, um, reported just feeling even more energy, like no, um, no more steady energy during the day instead of feeling like uh, you need a nap uh, in the afternoon. So again, it, it's interesting how we all react differently to the same thing. Uh, and again, I know this is dose dependent, so if you usually have one espresso, two, three, four, <laughs> but um, it's it's quite interesting and that's why I'm I'm running this experiment. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we've spoken for I think about just over twenty five minutes on, on the subject of coffee and caffeine. So I think it'll be a good time to uh um go on to the next one. But before I do, I think yeah, you, you summarized everything very well. Um I guess if we had to summarize that conversation in some sort of way then maybe you, you have your own one, I could say I think that uh, caffeine it can be an incredible tool to use, but it can also be a very easy tool to abuse at the same time i wasn't meant to uh that wasn't meant to rhyme but i guess it will stick in your head more if it now it does rhyme so yeah i think just be just be mindful of the way you do use it and um and you know what well i think this is very important to mention as well maybe to some people it might sound obvious maybe more to like southern europeans but obviously there is a a culture i think you know this is me just speaking from my experience, I would say in the UK and the USA, definitely. Uh, maybe there is more places like this where when we're speaking about coffee, we mean actual coffee. So not with like five or six or seven or eight spoons of sugar and a whipped cream on top and chocolate sprinkles and uh, what might have a, a borderline cheesecake in. I mean, just like a, an actual, maybe like a coffee with some milk. Yeah. Yeah. I think that might be important to establish because, you know, when you add in all those other factors, then that can take the conversation down a whole load of other routes as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we were definitely talking about coffee, like black coffee. Yeah. It, I mean, if you want to add a splash of milk, it would be my guess. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely not the 
frappuccinos that have a bit of caffeine. Because, <laughs> yeah, that's increasing in popularity now. And, yeah, and when I, I've met people who, when they say coffee, that's what they mean. They don't mean, like, a, an espresso, like we might do in Portugal. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I think it's, now is a good time. I can't believe it. I never thought I'd speak about coffee for 30 minutes today. But anyway, I think now is a good time to go on to the next conversation. And I was actually going to speak about ice baths, but I think jet lag can actually be quite interesting because it is something that a lot of people, I think more people are likely to go through jet lag within their life than they are to take an ice bath. So I think, you know, we can still speak about both, but I think there is more value in speaking about jet lag and how you said maybe, I don't know if an eight hour difference was the worst that you felt. Mine was, I think, nine. And uh, the yeah, so a nine hour difference was, I think, yeah, the biggest difference I've ever felt perhaps. And uh, I remember, so flying from London to Tokyo and to be totally transparent, those first few days were just like a blur. And uh, I thought, you know, maybe there could be some value in maybe how to just, I guess, adjust to a new routine, like a, just like trying to fix your sleep, sleeping pattern, perhaps. Mm. And you know, on that note, because obviously you do, like it is important to fix your sleeping pattern. Um, when you're in a, a new country and uh, obviously adjust to the time zone and that goes without saying but you know what i i've been listening a lot to uh, the mind pump podcast as i've said to you and i remember the other day i heard them <clears throat> mention a really good point actually and that's that and i wasn't actually going to initially mention this but we can go down this route as well where most people even every weekend they're almost giving themselves jet lag where you know maybe they're following a consistent sleep routine for some days of the week but then you know when friday and or saturday comes around they then end up staying up until like 3 or 4 a.m and uh and then because of that they're almost giving themselves a like a uh, like almost like a jet lag because then when monday comes back and they're back at work they're you know j- then trying to fight that jet lag again trying to sort their sleeping pattern out and maybe they only fix it by wednesday or thursday and then before they know it friday and saturday is here again and they give themselves jet lag again because they're then sleeping super late and uh and I'm going down a rabbit hole that I didn't think I was, but that can have some real impact on the body as well. And, you know, I'm not trying to sound like someone who's just like lives a boring life and, you know, they're trying to like, quote unquote, optimize everything here. But I do think uh, because I, this isn't even like a marginal thing. I think this has got a much bigger impact than I think a lot of people might even realize within their day to day life and just on their general health. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I mean. I can give you a pretty good example of uh, how um, usually I, I deal with jet lag and some of the things I've, I've experienced. I agree with everything you said. I think you put it, um, you know, it was a great summary. And I will say, even if you're not trying to optimize your health or everything, jet lag can definitely just impact the overall enjoyment that you get out of life. Like you oh, said, yeah. Uh, yeah. if the first days were a blur, didn't necessarily enjoy those first days it's not that they were bad days it's just that perhaps you weren't as energetic or as present and if that uh, mood goes on for let's say more than a few days if you never actually try to um, not optimize but change your circadian rhythm or get back uh, into a routine that actually makes you feel better then you're always going to be in that state kind of uh almost like i am today it's it's interesting that you said that because i did uh go to bed a bit late (laughs) oh yeah yeah we did mention that before the podcast yeah so i am a bit sleep deprived today and i can definitely feel it but again imagine people that do this uh on a regular basis yeah maybe every other day maybe once every four days yeah that's that's definitely Uh, they're they're constantly fighting yeah their circadian rhythm yes is the right word yeah and it's interesting because that can link or be associated with, with caffeine as well. Because if you're uh, going to bed late and you're feeling sleep deprived, then you yeah. have an extra espresso to get that extra jolt of energy. And it's a vicious cycle. Yeah, that is and, a quite a cycle. Yeah, and it's more common than you think. Um, at least, you know, speaking from my personal experience and, and professional experience as well. Um, but some, some quick tips, like quick fire tips that always help me beat jet lag is... Uh, number one, try and get your meals adjusted to, um, you know, wherever you are. So let's say, and this happened recently, I think when I went to Mexico, um, I got there 
actually I was lucky because I got there uh, at midnight. So even though it was like uh, meal time here in Portugal, I think I just I went straight to bed. Like that's a no brainer. And then uh, you know get those meals uh, scheduled so that um, it it does help just to get their routine started. Uh, but most importantly, I would say try and get some sunlight uh, in the morning if possible. Like that that's um, very important uh, to uh, establish the circadian rhythm. And this is the probably, I would say, most important tip. Try to get some exercise in on those first, uh, especially on that first day. Uh, just even if it helps you get feel a bit more tired and sleep better at the end of the day, it's definitely going to help you readjust to the new uh, time zone. Um, and it, it's quite interesting. Whenever I travel somewhere, usually... I don't get, you know, I don't feel the jet lag when I'm traveling somewhere, but when I'm coming back home, that's when I usually feel it. And I, I'm, really? Yeah, and I'm not sure why that happens. I've heard you actually feel it more when you fly east. Okay. So when you fly towards the east, that's when you really feel it. And sometimes, and actually, when you fly west, you feel it less. Okay. Uh, I can't remember why. I think, I think. Is something to do with flying in the direction of the way the world is rotating. I, I don't but I, I haven't looked into it enough. This was actually quite a few years ago at university and I don't remember it too well now, that subject. But yeah, I do yeah. remember it's harder when you fly east. And when I flew east to Japan and nine hour difference, I've heard, oh yeah, and on this note, I think it's quite just a, a fun fact. Did you know that to sort out your jet lag, it takes about a day per each hour difference? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So it and coincidentally, it did take me about a week and a half to fix my jet lag in Japan. I remember the first day was just like, just whatever. It's like I can't even remember what time I got there. I think it was like around lunchtime, and I felt like shit because I was on a plane for so long. And I remember by like six p.m., I was so tired, and I went to take a nap, forced myself awake at like eight. Uh, because I was just so tired like I think the first I think the first one first day like I wasn't even thinking about fixing my jet lag I was just such my body was such a mess uh, just from water traveling and being in a completely different time zone but yeah eventually obviously yeah it's like you said uh, do start to make a conscious effort to fix it and uh, you know do do your best to just you know see sunlight when at logical times and start eating meals at times where it, it makes sense and uh, yeah in schedule with uh, the local time but yeah i was a uh, yeah it was um those those first few days were tough partly because i was staying in a, a hostel as well when i first got there so there were other people staying in my room and they yeah. were tourists as well and they, they didn't really give a damn whether they were keeping me up or not so i quickly changed yeah yeah i can imagine it sounds tough <laughs> That, yeah, I, if I even, to be honest, like, now we're here, I, I, it won't even affect anyone. This would, You know, I, I would say, this isn't even too much info, this is just the straight-up truth of what happened that first night. I'll never forget, like, I'm tired, uh, i just got into Japan, it was like a 16-hour journey overall. Um, I'm exhausted, again, like, uh, just, you know, I, I don't even know what time or day it is anymore. It's like 1am, and, uh, and I was in a hostel, so there's like seven people in the room and this couple just starts having sex in the middle of the room and i was like this is crazy like i am tired as i am so tired right now and uh yeah and i i, I was just like there like i don't even think it woke <laughs> anyone else up but i was already awake because i was already jet lagged yeah uh, yeah i was just like no this is so i never forgot my so that's my first night in japan for you which i obviously <laughs> never forgot um but yeah i ended up changing rooms after that uh so yeah that was a, an interesting story, but yeah, on a that was a, 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 a slight sidetrack. But um, yeah, it's uh, as you said, amending to uh, just the local time and routine is definitely something to think about. That helps. Something that helped me was again just yeah, like I already mentioned, was um just uh, yeah seeing sunlight at logical times and slowly adjusting to uh, the local time with uh, food as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree and uh, that definitely was a memorable night <laughs> yeah i never forgot it first night in japan i'm yeah. like do you want to hear like sometimes when i'm just talking to people I'll be, uh, you know oh you want to hear about my first night in japan you know what? another fun fact this is going to be completely on a on a on a completely different note about nothing com uh, completely unrelated you know i've met ben and jerry okay did you did you even know they were real people a lot of people didn't i, I didn't know yeah it's a fun fact 
Yeah, I, I I met them in the in the US and I got a free limited uh, edition flavor of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Nice. But it wasn't just me; it was a few people because they're from Vermont, and I did an exchange here in Vermont, and uh, they lived in the same city, I think, at least. But yeah, they definitely lived in the state, so they came by and gave out some limited edition ice cream. So yeah, something to tell the grandkids. Mm-hmm. What flavor was it? I don't remember now. This is such a long time ago. But I do remember thinking like, oh damn, this is so cool. My friends aren't going to believe me. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, at the time, it's like, oh, I, I don't know why I didn't, I, I should have taken a picture or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Um, you know, just uh, to add... Uh, on the, the topic of jet lag, two things I remember that can actually be interesting on the subject of caffeine. Yeah. Like if you're finding, so one of the things is, like you said, you want to either force uh, awake, like set an alarm to make sure that you're not sleeping in. Cause that's just, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's stuff. That's something I did yeah. as well. Yeah. Good one. Uh, but if let's say you get there in the middle of the afternoon and you're super tired because it's, I don't know, early in your country or it's getting close to bedtime wherever you're from and you're just sleepy a bit of uh coffee can actually help Mm -hmm. you stay up or if it's the other way around if you're not sleepy and you feel like it would be better to actually sleep you could uh take some melatonin to kind of help you um get your circadian rhythm adjusted to that new time zone so melatonin is not something I usually recommend supplementing with, uh, especially long term, because a lot of people when they are dealing with insomnia, they're like, oh, I should just, uh, you know, get some pills. Not just with insomnia, most people resort to, uh, you know, meds or pills just to help them uh, get through stuff. Um, but I would say melatonin can actually be quite handy when it comes to dealing with jet lag. But it, it does depend on how you respond to it. Uh, for me personally, usually I don't think it has that much of a, an impact on me. And I always, always, always wake up with this. Not massive. It's not a headache, but it's like there's a weight on my head. What, when you take melatonin? Yeah, yeah. When I wake up the next morning, it's almost like, um, yeah, there's just a, a weight on, on top of my head, uh, which is interesting. I know not everyone experiences this. Some people, they take melatonin, they sleep uh, pretty well. Uh, and then, yeah, they, they adjust a bit better. Mm. Um, there was also something I was going to say about melatonin, but I, I forget. So if, if it comes back, I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah, with melatonin, I haven't taken it for a long time. And when I did take it, it was a long time ago. And it wasn't really when I, it, it wasn't during the time where I was very conscious of you know, just like what effect it was having on me. Mm. Um, so I can't really add to that melatonin part. But, um, you know, one thing I actually found helped with my jet lag and this actually came uh, to me as you were just speaking there is I didn't do this straight away because, you know, I've been traveling for a long time and my body felt exhausted. But, you know, after like five days of being in the country, eventually I signed up to a gym because I wasn't just on holiday in Japan. Like When I went there, it was to move there. Um you know, obviously, if I'm going on holiday for like two weeks, I'm not signing up to a gym. But yeah, 15, I was there for what I thought would be a year. I ended up staying for 15 months. And uh, yeah, I signed up to a gym, I think on day five or six, same day I used it. And I found that actually exercising really helped me, I found personally, with just fixing my sleeping pattern as well. Mm-hmm. So I don't know about you, like, do you feel, feel like that's just like maybe it was a bit of a placebo or do you think there was some sort of valuable there no, uh, yeah. value there i should say yeah absolutely yeah. that's that's uh one of my um most important tips to dealing with jet lag probably number one or number two with the sunlight and uh adjusting your meals but yeah exercise is, is a no-brainer it just it, it, it helps mm. at least from my personal experience, I, I can tell you if I get a, a session in, even if it's just going for a, a long walk, it doesn't have to be the gym. Uh, but, you know, usually um, if you can find a park where you can do some pull-ups, some push-ups and just move your body a bit, that helps. If you can have access to a gym, perfect. You know, get a, a good workout in uh, and you'll feel better. You'll probably sleep better and it does help you readjust. So, yeah. And you know what? Actually, this is a complete 
kind of random actually it's not as random as the some of the subject types subjects i've brought up on this podcast already but on the note of exercising and japan i think this is going to interest you this is actually something i found out about today is that so when i was in japan so some context first when i was in japan this was actually obviously when i got there was actually like two days before the uk lockdown so when i got there was when like covid was really like starting to come full force because I moved there in March 2020, so that's when like a lot of European countries locked down, and mm. coincidentally, like the day after I arrived, uh, Japan just like shut itself off from the world, so they didn't allow anyone else to come in. So I got really lucky. But anyway, so I was doing a lot of exercising um, outside. But Japan is like, even like, just throughout my whole life, it's the only country where I've seen a lot of elderly people exercise in the park. Like I, I saw a lot of exercise, like elderly people exercising in the park. And the, and the thing is, gyms were only closed in Japan for six weeks. So it's not because gyms were closed, like they were only closed for six weeks. Like gyms were open for a very long time. And even then I still saw el- lots of elderly people exercising in the park. And I thought that was quite interesting. Like you'd see loads of people just, they'd go up to the bars, they'd do chin-ups, they'd do pull-ups, they'd do all sorts. And I was like, wow, like that's very impressive. And then I found out today, and I don't think this is a coincidence, that Japan, I think it's called mortality rates, uh, so people mm-hmm. pass away from maybe something specific. Yeah. Japan has one of the lowest mortality rates in the world for people who, for elderly people who pass away from falling over. Mm. So, you know, sometimes, obviously I'm sure even just a listener might know someone who's passed away because they've gotten quite elderly and they didn't have that balance anymore. Yeah. And maybe and something serious happened. Whereas in Japan, they actually have one of the lowest mortality rates for that. And I'll be honest, I didn't fact check that, but it was from quite a reliable source. So I, I do believe it. Uh, so I just thought that was really interesting. And uh, just a fact I thought I'd share. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. And it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, naturally, we start losing muscle mass as we age. Yeah. And uh, that that saying of you either use it or you lose it, uh, it, it's pretty much the way it goes with muscle mass. And as you get older, you start losing uh, not only your strength, but also your um, a bit of mobility and just independence, as in you need help to do the basics. Yeah, balance as well. Exactly, yeah. Imagine... You go to the bathroom, you need help to get, um, you know, maybe not sitting on the toilet, but getting up from the toilet, you might need a bit of assistance. And if you lose your balance and you fall, and, and this is going to sound a bit dramatic, but if you break a hip... But, no, it's a very yeah, real scenario. This, this, These know, things happen, yeah. yeah. And I, I know you know, and I know, but I think a lot of maybe, you know, listeners, they're not going to be personal trainers themselves, so they wouldn't maybe have ever had to work with mm. an elderly person trying to improve their strength but we've both seen this firsthand so it's yeah it's a very real scenario and it, it can certainly happen absolutely yeah and one of the things a lot of uh people maybe don't know or never consider is that exercise is not just about you know gains and looking and good naked personal right? bests and deadlifting exactly, a thousand yeah. kg exactly it's not just about that but one of the big benefits especially if we're talking about the elderly is that exercise also improves uh, bone density. So Mm. your bones are literally uh, more resilient um, and they're bigger compared to someone that doesn't exercise. Yeah, yeah. And if you do end up falling, your body is more resilient. Uh, You probably, even if you do get a fracture, it's not going to be as bad as if you're just a frail, in this case, old man or (laughs) old old lady. so yeah, I think that's one of the many benefits of regular exercise. Yeah. And you know, a, a bit of an off topic, but this is is going to tie into what you said. A lot of people stop exercising or they never get into exercise uh because they have this all or nothing mindset. So you, you don't exercise or you go to the gym every single day. Like Two to three times per week, I'm guessing, even with COVID, you were seeing a lot of people uh, just, you know, doing pull-ups, chin-ups, push-ups, etc. Even just doing a few sets of each is is fantastic. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's pretty cool. I, I didn't know that, but yeah. I, I can definitely imagine. And yeah. Japan is on my... Um, oh, I would recommend it. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to go maybe next year. Uh, I'm planning to go again March or April. 2024. Yeah. 
you're, you'll be going for cherry blossom season. Uh, was exactly. that intentional? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but you know, on that subject of just training elderly people as well, I even got a flashback. I think, you know, I've trained a lot of people by now, but even until this day, so when I was training people in person, I, I don't do one-to-one anymore. I just work online with my Curious Online members. But when I was uh, training people in person, one of, again, I, I, so many people made so much progress and there was all sorts of wins across the board. But one of, I think the coolest like major signs of progression I ever saw in one of my clients was uh, I think he was in like his mid fifties when he first came to me, he couldn't get up from the floor. Like if he ended up on the floor somehow, he would need all sorts of support to help him get up. So maybe just someone to help him up or he'd have to hold on to several things. And after working with me for a few weeks, he could eventually get up from the floor by himself and you know, it's just small things like that we take for granted in day-to-day life. But it's as you said, if you don't lo- uh, use it, you lose it. Yeah. And uh, and yeah, I think it's just one of those things that are hard to uh, understand or really appreciate until maybe you're in that position. Um. So yeah, that was just a, a random flashback I have. I ha- I had. Uh, but was there anything else you wanted to add? Because I've just realised I didn't bring my laptop charger with me, and the laptop's close to dying. So this is probably a good time to start winding down the podcast episode. But did you have anything you wanted to add that we can go into? We still probably got like 15 more minutes of uh, laptop juice. <laughs> yeah, you know, on a, a final note, uh, just to kind of wrap up what you were saying, um, health is not just health, but health in particular. It's interesting because we don't value it as much until we don't have it. Uh, in yeah. other words, it's like if you're generally not sick, when you do get sick or even with COVID, um, you'll miss being healthy. Yeah. And you'll be like, damn, this really sucks. Like, I, I hate feeling like this. I, I miss feeling good. Same thing when you get an injury. Like, if you usually, you know, can do a lot of basic s- stuff and then you injure, let's say, your shoulder and then suddenly you have trouble with, you know, basic things like reaching overhead for a jar or something like that. You're like, ah, oh, man, I wish... Uh, I could uh, go back to when I didn't have this injury. Uh, So it's always like we only value our strength and uh, we only want to take good care of our bodies when we're actually dealing with something. Uh, And again, we're pretty biased, but fitness and regular exercise is literally uh, the best preventive, uh, not sure if I can call it medicine, but uh, measure a pre preventive measure you can take uh, to um, have a strong resilient body as in you know you'll recover faster chances of getting injured are uh, you know fewer chances of getting sick also reduce and if you do get sick you'll probably bounce back faster um, so yeah I I think again if you're listening to this podcast chances are you already know the benefits of uh staying healthy and exercise because of leo um but it it definitely is something that has been on my mind especially um even with the elderly my my grandparents they're uh you know they're not getting younger and they've been dealing with some things that it wasn't it wasn't an issue a few years ago uh, especially with balance and yeah so seeing them age really um makes me think that if you can generate as much momentum as possible to age gracefully with you know strength and just maintain even if you're just maintaining a a solid uh physique like take care of your strength and take care of your body um you'll live it's it's not about living just longer but living with more uh quality of life uh as in you might be 60, 70, 80, but you don't need help to go to the bathroom. You can get up from the floor if you do fall. Uh, you can open that jar uh, if you want the peanut butter. Mm. Um, and that for me is invaluable. You know, it's it's something that I can definitely envision. And it, I think it's, it's, it's a goal for sure. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point to leave the podcast on. So Miguel, where can people find you? You can find me uh, on Instagram at Miguel D. Mendez, but with an S. I'll leave it in the show notes of this podcast yeah, so people can't get it wrong. Yeah, I appreciate that. <sighs> Thank yeah. you for having me. 
Yeah. Thank you for coming on. Uh, if you're listening from Miguel's side, you can find me at Leo Alves PT. Uh, uh, and Alves is spelled A L V E S. It's not with a Z. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, A L V E S, Leo Alves PT. But like, uh, like, I'll do. I'll also leave the those uh, social media handles in the show notes of this podcast episode. But otherwise, again, Miguel, thank you very much for coming on. It was very fun speaking about caffeine, coffee, jet lag, and balance falling over <laughs> uh, so yeah otherwise take care and i'll see you around actually you're still going to be here so you know i'm gonna you're not going anywhere but yeah take care and see you around to the listener <laughs> that wraps it up for another episode of the leo alves podcast i do hope you enjoyed listening to this episode if you did then please do consider sharing it with your friends family group chat or even anyone else who you know could be interested in listening to that episode otherwise if you haven't already then please do leave a five-star review on whichever platform you are listening to this on and remember all the relevant links such as the inquiry form to potentially become a keros online member my social media handles a free fat loss guide and a free workout plan are all also found in the show notes of this podcast episode as well otherwise take care and i'll see you around